what has led you here? I became very interested in organizational change 22 years ago. I have been studying it ever since. I work with very large organizations that are trying to do new things. And in the beginning, I was super rational. I was all about economics. I was all about rationality. And as I kept working with firms, I came to believe that that was incredibly important. But the firms that made significant shifts were able to engage the emotions of their employees, were able to use what we would now call affiliative consciousness, were able to get people engaged in ways beyond the purely rational and the purely economic. And I didn't have many tools for thinking about that or talking about that. And so I became very interested in modern research in neurobiology and in behavioral economics, which, to sum up horribly, says it really matters. Emotions really matter. They affect emotion. They affect emotions, affect belief. They affect action. They're central to behavior. And so that's why I'm here. Can you, can you say a little bit about, uh, a little bit definitional about uh, behavioral economics and, and, and neuroeconomics? just to, to ground us a little bit in this discussion. Well, they're both enormous fields, so it's very hard to define them easily. Uh, in general, behavioral economics is the study of how people actually behave, much of it at the moment done in labs. And what that's been able to show is people behave in ways that are directly in contradiction to the assumptions and models of traditional neoclassical economics. And uh, it's fascinating. So the the results are very interesting. So, for ne example, the rational actor theory of neoclassical economics may not pan out in the, in the behavioral model. Well, there are anomalies. There are things that happen that won't be predicted by the rational model. So a classic example would be if I gave you a chocolate bar and I gave your friend uh, a mug, and I said, OK, well, you know, you're willing to get rid of your chocolate bar or you're get willing, willing to get rid of your mug people get attached to objects they own in ways that neoclassical theory simply doesn't predict. It should be that if the chocolate bar and the mug are both worth about $5, you should be indifferent between getting the $5, getting the mug, getting the chocolate bar. That's not how people behave. People are very attached to what they have. That's a simple example. Um, another example, it's a little bit complicated, would be something called transitive, transitive preferences. But basically, People don't always want what the mathematics should say they want. Uh, something much more subtle and interesting is going on. And I became very excited about the possibility of incorporating some of this work into my mainstream work on strategy and organization. I think the important thing is not to think, oh, rationality is dead, or you know, the left brain is, is, is gone. Um, it's much more about balancing these two perspectives on humans so that we're thinking both rationally and emotionally and drawing on the latest science as we do that. So when it comes to um, predicting or influencing consumer behavior or organizational behavior, uh, what is it that we're missing if we rely on the, on the classical rational models that might be a resource for making a difference in climate change? In organizational change, we're missing the vital importance of engaging people emotionally, engaging their delight in working together with others towards a common goal, which is something that comes very strongly out of the neuroeconomics. We are missing the fact that people are ethically motivated, that they do want to do the right thing, that they can care about the future in very deeply felt, intuitive ways. And if we're not aware of that, if we simply try and manipulate people, we're not going to make the kinds of changes that we need to make. Um, and uh, can, can a model uh, take this into account? Or how, how could uh, the insights of uh, what you just mentioned, the, the, the motivation of um, people to have, have the joy of collaboration and community and so forth, uh, uh, is there a way to model this economically? And more importantly, is there a way for uh, the climate movement, the NGOs, the policy people, the, the community organizers to, to, to predict this and tap into it in a way that, that makes a difference? I'm an academic, so I'll say we're working on it, but it's not finished. It's not a done deal. My own scholarly research is about trying to build mathematical models of the importance of relational contracts in organizations 
trying to understand where relationship comes from, why it's very important, and by modeling it mathematically to be able to incorporate it in our dominant ways of thinking about these issues. Can we immediately give a fully finished model to people working in climate change? Absolutely not. Do we have building blocks that are provocative and may make a difference and provide some ways in? I think we do. Is, is there evidence that, that these new models and uh, ways of predicting behavior have been uh, received at, by, by corporations or at the organizational level that you can cite? My experience has been that people have been doing this informally for years. That if you work with an experienced business person and you tell them that engaging the emotions of their employees and having a positive vision of the future and getting people excited about working together is important, they're going to look at you and go, well, yeah. I mean, they know that. But what we haven't had is the tools to be able to talk about that as rigorously as we talk about the fact, well, that looks expensive in the short term and how do I put that in the incentive system? So in some ways, the models are legitimating things that all of us have an intuition around. But I think the, having the rigorous science, having the model, helps us pay more attention to a lot of what we already know intuitively, helps us give more weight to it, helps us pay attention to these other uh, very important ways of behaving in a more nuanced and balanced way. One of the uh, presentations we heard here today um, said that uh, when it comes to uh, scenario planning and actually having a blueprint to get even to 450 you know, parts per million of carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, we don't have one. That, that, that currently, there is no plausible scenario that will get us to where we need to go. Do, do you think there, there is insight, or can, can you give me your opinion about you know, the insights of, of these disciplines uh, new models uh, of behavioral neuroeconomics for, for explaining behavior uh, that might uh, help direct us towards a scenario or give us hope that, that one could be uh, created? First, I think it's important to understand that it's not that we can't get to 450 parts per million technologically. The technologies are quite straightforward. We know how to do that. The reason that the speaker today said we can't get there is we can't see our way through the political barriers, through the motivational barriers to implementing what we know would make a difference. And I think the good news here is that the dominant discourse has been about individuals as individual rash rational actors maximizing their own well-being in a world full of anomy and it's all about prices and it's all about markets. The good news is we now have very good science to support what intuition has said for many years, that there's much more to human behavior than that. And that if we can click in, if we can reach, if we can help people release the engagement with their community, the excitement of working together, the passion that's released when you think you're making a difference and you're with other people, we can certainly make this transition. We know from the research that happiness does not increase with income. We know that happiness past a very important minimum threshold of having enough to eat and good places to sleep. Happiness is associated with my friends and my community and whether I feel I'm making a difference. And we can now see that in the brain scans and in the experiments. So responding to climate change is an opportunity to make a difference, to engage with my community, to feel that my life is meaningful. If we can find a way to motivate those kinds of roots of action at scale and on time, we can do this.